welcome to Malin Books. So glad you could be here with us today. Today we're going to be hearing from uh, Larry Morris. And Larry Morris lives on 35 acres with his wife Michelle and a big, fat, lazy cat named Bubba in a very rural area outside a small town in Central Texas. Although he still works for a living in the computer, si computer software industry, writing is now his free time passion. He hopes you enjoy reading these stories as much as he enjoyed writing them. And please join me in welcoming Larry Morse. Good afternoon, I'm Larry Morris. Uh, I am from the Wimberley area. Uh, and that's lately been known as the, now known as the flood capital of Texas with all the rain they've had. Um, I write science fiction exclusively, and I currently have six books published. Uh, all of them are available on Amazon, uh, in Kindle, and paperback format, and we have obviously some today. Uh, today's reading is from my latest book, New Territory. It was the one that was awarded the best sci-fi book of 2016 by the Texas Association of Authors. Um, and I'll take questions after the reading if there are any. First of all, a little background to set the read up so you know what's going on. Uh, the story of the, in this book takes place in a little town called Fall City, Nebraska. Uh, it's a small, very small town in southeastern Nebraska right up next to the Missouri River. And a little bit of the book takes place in Craig, Missouri, which is across the Missouri River and a little north of that. These places actually exist. Uh, nothing, obviously nothing that happens in the book actually takes place. And none of the people in the book are actually from that town. But I needed a small town, real town, in a flat spot in Nebraska or Kansas or Missouri where this can happen. The main characters are Mark and Sarah. And you find out very soon at the beginning of the book that uh, they both work for a particle collider that was built such that its physical center was right in Fall City, Nebraska. So it spreads out from there and a ring around Fall City. And they have recently lost their son, eight years old, in a uh, senseless accident just a few months before. And they're now trying to get over the loss. Uh, at the particle collider, Everybody in this little town works there for the most part. And this is one, uh, a collider that's much bigger than the one at CERN. And they are dealing with energy levels that nobody has explored yet. So they don't really know what's going to happen if it works the way it's supposed to work. <coughs> and along with some damage that's caused by a lightning storm, when they do start to make some runs at the collider, some strange things happen in the town, and that's kind of that kind of sets up the read. For the past two hours, Tanner had been spinning up the first run of neutrinos to bombard the new impact drills. The military had specked out and Tanner and Mark had built and installed. It had taken almost three hours that afternoon to set up the extractor system onto the neutrino containment device and another two hours to install and align the new impact grids. Seven hours into the day and he was still about an hour away from the first actual test impact. This one wasn't even going to be recorded. It was just a first test run to make sure that everything was aligned properly and that they could indeed get to the energies required for the tests. Tanner and Mark were the only two people who knew the makeup of the new impact grids. And Tanner almost didn't make it on the list. The Army was initially adamant that only Mark be cleared for building and testing the grids. And it had taken Mark almost two weeks to convince the military that he couldn't do it alone and that Tanner was probably even more capable of this than Mark was. Finally, they relented and allowed Tanner to go through the vetting process and be on the project. That took almost three weeks by itself. What he was involved in now was really the boring part of the run. Filling the beams, it's known as. Slowly feeding more and more neutrinos into the circulating beam until it reached the target saturation. Then, once the quantity was close, 
ramping up from the fill energy to the final collision energies by slowly applying power to the massive magnets that accelerated the particle stream faster and faster. Sometimes, depending on the makeup of the particle stream and what it was going to hit, the process could take several hours or even several days. Most of the time, multiple collisions would happen all along the circular path once the beam was up to specific energy, until the particle stream was depleted and the leftovers dumped before a new one was initiated. For this particular run, and any subsequent ones for the new impact grids, there would only be one collision when or if the particle stream reached its target energy. Tanner had been scanning four consoles that reflected the health of the system and recording stats on his tablet. He had just started cranking up the magnets and the focus points to squeeze the beam down to an impact diameter when alarms started going off. He killed the alarms to keep things as quiet as possible and keyed his intercom mic for the focus point crew at the other end of the football sized control room. Drew, this is Tanner, he said in his handset. Are you seeing the fall off of the first main focus point? Yes, we are, Drew replied. It looks like more quadrupole magnets have failed. Didn't they just install recently some, new, some, some of those brand new? Yes, Drew replied, but not on this focus point. This is the last set of the original magnets from the contractor that went belly up right after we started. Everyone was hoping this set would hold out for a little longer. Do we have any more of the new batch? Yes, he replied, we do. When we saw the first ones fail, we ordered enough for all of them. We just had hoped to put off the reinstall for as long as possible. Well, we're going to have to dump this run and set up for another one tomorrow, Tanner said. Have the crews start replacing those failing quadrupoles with the new batch, and we'll bypass this focus point tomorrow. How long till it be up and ready again? From Sarah's notes, it looks like it might take the rest of this coming week for the ones she and her team are working on now. So that means another two weeks, probably, until they're all set up again. With the remaining two fo will the remaining two focus points work for these runs until then? I think so, Tanner said. We'll just have to recompute the fill times and all the numbers for the other two focus points, but I think we can make it work. Thanks, we'll just have to dump this run in a few minutes. Roger that, Drew said. Tanner began the shutdown process by turning off the accelerator magnet relays in the proper sequence. This part of the shutdown process took just a couple minutes. He then reached for the switch that would turn on the redirecting magnets to steer the neutrino beam into the dumping area, but he hesitated. Instead, he first engaged the mass spectrometer detector just for grins to get a readout and then turned on the redirecting magnets. In a split second, the beam of neutrinos with enough kinetic energy built up to melt a small bus hit the lightning damaged dumping plates. Sparks flew, voltages arced from plate to plate, and the dumping plates began reacting. They seemed to sizzle and shimmer as if in a heat wave. During this shimmering effect, the detector would later show the dumping plates were spewing streams of particles never before detected. Heavier than a neutron, but much faster, they emitted in all directions from the dumping plates, almost symmetrically, but the only thing in their path that also reacted were the new impact grids from the military. These odd particle streams hit those plates and produced a wave, almost like a shock wave, that slowly propagated itself throughout the collider, its control center, and ultimately the towns of Fall City and Craig. No one would know this for a day or so, but the waves were almost undetectable. And they were the frequency of delta brain waves, the waves generated by the brain when we are deeply asleep and not dreaming. Tanner reached for his coffee cup after flipping the switch that turned on the red redirecting magnets and stopped short of grabbing it. Everything that had happened with the particle beam, the dumping area, the new military impact grids, had happened in the space of time between him flipping the switch and reaching out to pick up his cup of coffee. Something, he couldn't say what, had made the coffee in his cup ripple. Small, short ripples that flowed slowly across the surface of the coffee in the cup. If he hadn't been anywhere else, the first thing he would have thought of was earthquake. He put his hand down on the table next to the coffee cup and just watched. 
In a few moments, the ripples subsided and didn't return. He wiped his hand across his face and just thought for a minute. If he reported this to anyone, it would shut down the whole section of this project and take months to restart. Besides, it was probably nothing. Maybe he even bumped the table himself. He grabbed the coffee cup and left for his office to write up all the reports. He mentioned nothing about the ripples in the coffee cup. The last thing he did was forward the data from the dump detector to the team of scientists that was on call to analyze it. They were a varying combination of particle physicists, engineers, and technicians that rotated through the facility every several months. The waves slowly drifted through the towns of Fall City and Craig, taking almost a full two hours to make it all the way through both towns. A third of the houses it passed, it affected. They all dreamed. They all dreamed the same thing, or at least they thought they were dreaming. And that's where we'll end it right there. <laughs>